Good morning, everybody. Good morning, uh, participants who have joined uh, on Zoom with us. Uh, welcome to the sixth symposium of the 30th anniversary scientific sessions of uh, Faculty of Medicine in the University of Kalania. And this particular symposium is focused on the transition from medical graduate to junior doctor. Let me start this session with a few extra extract from of uh, intern doctors who have described their own experiences of transition from graduate to an intern doctor. This was included in a study carried out by uh, Prince et al. in Netherlands. I'm quoting. At the beginning of this job as an intern, I did not know more than I did as a clerk, but suddenly I have to take decisions. As a clerk, I train along behind the house officer, occupied with, the, uh, how, uh, occupied with how to behave and act. Now, I am a house officer myself. I suddenly have a job to perform with accompanying responsibilities. As a clerk, it was a big thing to make diagnosis, but now, all of a sudden, I'm also responsible for right diagnosis and right treatment. So, a uh, challenging task is to transform from, from a medical graduate to a junior doctor. We are going to explore this topic in two perspectives, uh, professionalism, identity formation, and clinical reasoning. Uh, let me introduce our first speaker today, uh, who will be focusing on professionalism identity formation. Our first speaker is R.D. Fandiatini. She's from Indonesia. Uh, R.D. Fandiatini is an associate professor in medical education from Faculty of Medicine, University of uh, Indonesia. She is currently the head of department of medical education, the head of medical education unit, and the coordinator of medical education cluster at University uh, Indonesia Medical uh, at University of uh, Indonesia. She has been teaching undergraduate, postgraduate programs in medical education and mentoring students and graduates in conducting research in medical education. With her team, she has been uh, very active in conducting workshops for faculty development in undergraduate and postgraduate education in Faculty of Medicine, University of uh, Indonesia and in other institutions in Indonesia for the past 13 years. She has been nominated as a panel member of Aspire Excellence in Faculty Development since 2014. She has authored and co-authored several international publications in peer-reviewed journals and conferences. She has also been involved as a reviewer of national and international medical education journals. Her research areas of interest include professionalism, faculty, uh, faculty development, clinical reasoning, uh, clinical teaching, interprofessional education, curriculum development, and sociocultural factors underpinning approaches in medical and health professions education. More than that, she is a good friend of us in Sri Lanka as in the field of medical education, and she has been helping us in many, many uh, activities. Let's listen to Professor R.D. Findiatini. Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, wherever you are now. Uh, my name is R.D. Findiatini, and uh, I come from the Department of Medical Education and Medical Education Research Center, Indonesia Medical Education and Research Institute at Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Indonesia in Jakarta, Indonesia. Today, I'm going to discuss with you an important concept very close to my heart in regards to professional identity formation, in particular, professional identity formations of our medical students and health professions education students. Why do they matter in this disruptive era? So I would like to structure my presentation into three main areas, which are the professional identity formations. I would like to revisit the key concepts on it. And then the professional identity formations and professional development, especially in the context of medical education and the impact of understanding professional identity formations for us, for medical students and for health professionals. First, when you hear about professional identity formations, what comes into mind? You might think something very 
sophisticated, very complex, or probably ideal values, ideal picture of how we can picture our medical students in the future. Or we can actually also relate this concept to ourselves, how we see ourselves professionally and how we come to this point, how we come this far, etc. So I hope that you can think of something, some concepts that relates to this concept according to yourself. So before we discuss about professional identity and professional identity formation, I would like to draw your attention to this concept first. Of course, all of us here, we know about the importance of the personal identity, which consists of three discourses, which is our individual identity, how we see ourselves, our values, our religion, our thoughts, our perceptions, and etc. And then secondly is the relational identity. We start to come outward with try to see ourselves in connections with our families, our colleagues, our students, our teachers, and etc. our patients. And then thirdly is the collective identity. How then all of the personal identities within certain environment can form the collective identity, how we see ourselves within our medical school, our teaching hospital, and whether we have the collective identity, which still can be connected with our personal identity. So as individuals, medical students, and actually all of us here as medical teachers, we develop themselves progressively um, into more complex system for making sense of the world. So the personal identity that we have is the, is the starting point for us to move to the professional identity, the dynamic uh, construct that we will discuss later on. In regards to medical students, Keegan, uh, based on the uh, Erickson uh, development theory, proposed the identity formation of our medical students that within the development in the medical schools, our students will go to three different stages of the professional identity formations, which it, of course will be influenced by their personal characteristic. The stages are the imperial stage, the interpersonal stage, and the institutional stage. So we can see here that in the imperial stage, individual will assume their professional roles, but it is primary, primarily motivated uh, to follow the roles and to be correct, and self-reflection is low. Moving on to the interpersonal, the individual can assume their professional roles and is oriented still towards sharing obligation, but tends to seek out those to emulate is more idealistic and self-reflective. And most of the time, the emotions are also generally under control. And finally, we hope that at least within the medical schools, be it in undergraduate or, and even in postgraduate medical training, the individual is able to understand the relationships in terms of different values and expectations. So in the institutional stage, we can see that people start to be able to see and to decide uh, the dilemma and their positions towards more complex work. The external values of the professionals become more internal values and they, they see their roles, they can uh, relate to their roles better and they can have the reason which are fully controlled over needs, desires and their individual passion. So it's very useful to see our medical students journey uh, how they form their professional identity coming from their characteristics and personal identity with this map from uh, Keegan stages. So as I mentioned before, the personal identity is very much the core or the start of the development of the professional identity. Underneath the personal identity, we have what we call as our personality, which is influenced by the e our ego identity and the interactions of that ego identity and personal identity uh, will, will influence and will facilitate how 
our medical students and ourselves reflect on what's happening and how we can then internalize what we have or what we are expected from us from our environment. And then the third part is the social identity where there will be validations or challenges by others, our environment, our colleagues, our junior, senior colleagues, our patients, and et cetera. And then here, the personal identity will have consistent negotiations with the social identity. And the interactions of this ego identity, personal identity, and social identity is very dynamic so that the personal and professional identity can move forwards and can be formed into more mature state, which is still very dynamic to be able to adapt in the growing or changing environment. So if we think about our personal identity and our professional identity, whenever we interact with different environments, how would we then introduce ourselves to our colleagues? or to our friends or family members, or to our students. I myself, I would introduce myself as I'm a medical teacher, medical educationalist and researcher, and I'm also a mother of two daughters. Basically, I would say this to, our, to my medical students, as well as to a new colleague coming to the conference on medical education, for example. So you may want, you, we may, have a different emphasis on our personal and professional identity whenever we interact with different groups of people. And it's normal to see and to re-emphasize and reprioritize re this uh, identities that we have. So we don't have an, one single identity personally and professionally. We might have some identities which later on will affect how we would prioritize and decide on our roles. So. Coming to the professional identity, we know that from the concept, professional identity involves understanding of ourselves in relation to others, to our environment. We can see we can start we can see the dynamic of the personal identity and also the social identity. And the narratives are very dynamic whenever we try to integrate the roles, the expected roles from the social environment as well as the internalized roles of ourselves. So the dynamic interaction and dynamic narratives and discussions from ourselves, how we see ourselves in, the, in medical schools, in, the, in our hospitals, in the patient care, and et cetera. And the professional identity actually are also affected very much by motivations that can be uh, the factors that can affect that can be the personal, moral, and social factors. And as I mentioned before, the professional identity is a dynamic construct. Uh, it requires consistent negotiation between identities of the professional identities or even between personal identities and professional identities. So it grows. It can uh, develop based on the needs and how we see ourselves at certain point of time and how we prioritize our roles. Whenever we talk about the professional identity of our medical students, of course, we expect that our current medical students become the future medical doctors with all attributes and all competence that we expect. So whenever we start to have them think of the professional identity formation, it's always important to highlight and to ask them to know themselves well, who they are, who am I? Uh, because throughout the medical schools, uh, I will explain to you the details later on the socialization process. The medical students will go to the complex nature and also can be facilitated socialization process. Then at the end of the medical education, their medical school and medical training, they can be the medical doctors. They become who they want to become they become who they, they are expected to become. In the socialization process, the key concepts is the involvement within the community of practice, as well as the social interactions. So the process of the professional identity formation, of course, is not in isolation. It requires the social interactions among medical students, 
between medical students and medical teachers, between medical students, medical teachers, clinical teachers, and also the patients, as well as with the system. So starting from the beginning, whenever our medical students start off their medical school, they are in the legitimate peripheral participation. So they still have a they still try to emulate or try to identify uh, their expected roles as medical student and try to understand the expected roles of the future medical doctors or who they want to become. Uh, but in a way, they still have very limited participations. Coming to the full participations when they have already uh, acquired knowledge, acquired skills and acquired uh, attitudes to be the future medical doctors coming from the first year to the, the final year of medical students, we hope that the students will we would feel that they are part of the community of practice. They are part of the uh, medical professionals through the learning interaction, through the participations in the patient care, uh, under supervision, uh, through the discussions with their clinical teachers, through their reflections and through their feedback seeking, etc. We hope that uh, during the professional identity formation journey, they will feel, they would feel, and they would take responsibility that they have that identity, the identity as the medical doctors. So whenever we talk about the socialization process, uh, this come this concept comes from the uh, the cruis and cruis, which is very important concept. Whenever we discuss about the professional identity formation, the socialization theory explains that with that existing uh, personal identities coming from our medical students during their first year and the, the developing of this personal identities, we can see that a lot of factors are coming in. The family, uh, how they, uh, the upbringings, the friends, and uh, their uh, previous social, social network or social environment. And then uh, also uh, we can see here that the socialization is also influenced by the learning environment, the healthcare system the availability of the role models and the mentors. We can discuss about the impact of the positive and even the negative role modelings here, as well as the clinical and non-clinical experiences, which needs to be reflected on so that all of the processes can be more meaningful for our medical students. And by having meaningful discussions within themselves, as well as the facilitated discussions of this professional identity, they can then develop the expected personal and professional identities through the self-assessment and through the uh, facilitations from the peers and uh, the clinical teachers and healthcare professionals, etc. So a lot of factors coming in, but actually what we need to highlight is that the existing personal identities we, 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 we in the medical schools, uh, we as uh, medical teachers, clinical teachers, we can uh, try to facilitate this socialization process so that the students can have a healthy process, uh, very, very encourage, encourage, uh, encouraging process to, be, to start from who they are to who they become. The professional identity formation indeed is part of the professionalism because we've been uh, understanding professionalism as a multifaceted uh, construct. Of course, we still need to understand that that way, but professional identity, personal and professional identity formation is part of it. In addition to the ethical values and at at attributes or virtue-based professionalism uh, or as behavior-based professionalism. So our understanding of professional identity formation hopefully can help us further in nurturing the professional development of our medical students in our medical schools. Whenever we ask further about the professional identity formations of medical students, can we measure that? Uh, whenever we try to uh, nurture this uh, development of the professional identity formation, do we need to measure that? Probably the measurement of the professional identity formations of medical education, medical students will be required at certain point of times, uh, especially whenever we aim to really try to support 
development. So not just measuring that. So I would like to share with you uh, our studies uh, inspired by study by Tagawa uh, on the development of scale to evaluate medical professional identity formation. So in uh, Tagawa study, there are five uh, subscales, which I will explain to you later. In our studies, uh, we have uh, we adapted and we validated the questionnaire from Tagawa in our context. Uh, the, the items work well in our setting, but uh, coming from our exploratory factor analysis and confirmatory factor analysis, we identified that there are four uh, subscales that support the professional identity formation constructs of our medical students. So we involve year two, year four, year six uh, uh, of medical students in our in our setting, in our medical school, and we also involve the second year, second and third year of uh, residents in different postgraduate medical uh, training. And we found that there are four uh, subskills here, which is the which are the first, the recognition and internal, internalizations of professional roles self-control in professional behavior, reflections on professionalism, and thought process as a medical and health professional. So we can see that from this, this concept uh, of the questionnaire, trying to measuring the professional identity formations of the medical students uh, from the beginning of their uh, medical study throughout the years, we can see that it actually reflects the concept of professional identity formation that I discussed before. So let me uh, bring you to the more specific items, uh, some examples of the items within its subscale. For example, in the uh, recognition and internalization of professional roles, this is the one of the questions. I take on various roles in accordance with the demands of society. The second subscale, uh, one of the example of the questions is the way I behave in medical setting is not my true self. Of course, it, this is the negative uh, statement, which in the scoring needs to be reversed first. And then for the last two, uh, this is the example uh, of uh, the, the questions. Uh, the reflections on professionalism, the example of the question is I have used my own beliefs and ideals as a standard to evaluate my own action as a physician. And uh, this, the last one is, I have never thought about the reasons or principles behind the required code of conduct as one of the examples for the thought processes as a medical and health professionals. So as I mentioned before, measuring the professional identity formations of medical students is one of the processes that we can, we can try in our medical schools to try to see where the students are at. And uh, as uh, this slide is presenting, the concepts that uh, that is suggested by Tagawa is that there are five uh, subscales coming from the same questionnaire that we have adapted, uh, of course. Uh, first is the self-control as a professional, awareness of being a medical doctor, reflection as a medical doctor, execution of social responsibility, external and internal self-harmonizations. So if we look back at our understanding of the personal identity and the professional identity that we have discussed previously, I think we can relate all of these subscales to that uh, construct, to that concept, which is supported further by the concept or constructs coming from Holden, that actually the professional identity formations and the professional identity itself is, is deriving from the personal characteristic, duties and responsibilities, habits, relationships, and perception and recognitions. So all of those processes, all of those key features need to be nurtured and facilitated whenever we aim to support the professional identity formations of our uh, medical students in our medical school. So furthermore, in addition to measuring the professional identity formations by first validating the questionnaire in our setting, uh, we also try to explore further because we don't know, we don't want to only identify what it is and where the students are at, but we would like to also explore further how and uh, what's happening. We would like to also uh, explore the journey. So uh, we conducted also the focus, focus group discussions. So uh, after we complete the, the, the questionnaire and the survey, 
and then uh, we identified two main themes from the focus group discussions with the second, fourth, and sixth year of medical student and also the residents, uh, that which are the process of professional identity formations in medical students, uh, consists of the sub-themes of how it started, the role of motivation, and also the journey, how the values are processed. And second theme is factors affecting the professional identity formations in medical student, which consists of internal and external factors. So let me uh, give you some examples of uh, some quotes uh, coming from uh, our medical students and residents explaining about each uh, sub themes. I have always felt that the purpose of my existence is to help others. And the way to do, to do that is by becoming a doctor. At first, I wanted to be an engineer, but later I realized that the impact that doctors can have on other people's lives is more profound. I realized that the process that I'm going through now is part of the learning. We can never tell what we might become unless we put forth our best effort and just finish the task. Even though it can be hard at times, just try to do it anyway. So to reflect on the first two sub themes, how it started and the journey. Moving on, factors affecting professional identity formation in medical student. So these are the internal and the external factors. Let me uh, give you the example of the quotes. The first internal factor, ideally as medical doctors, we have to keep learning and not be easily satisfied with our current performance and we should never look down on other doctors. The external factor, we realize that learning is not entirely about knowing the subject matter. As you become involved in patient care, you see that you need more than that. And sometimes what we are taught does not align with the reality in practice. So by having those explorations, we, we try to understand further the journey, the dynamic process experienced by our medical students coming from their first years to the final year so that hopefully we can identify how we can best support the, and best facilitate this professional identity formation. And we do understand that for the past two years, uh, we've been dealing with a lot of challenges due to the pandemic, a lot of disruptions. So whenever we realize about these disruptions, we then uh, try to go back to our aim in nurturing and facilitating the professional identity formations of our medical students. And coming from uh, this, this editorial, uh, I can say that the pandemic, we, we need to see the pandemic as the catalyst of changes, necessary change. Uh, there will be a lot of changes uh, which are meaningful to us, how we conceptualize knowledge, how we manage trust, the trust between medical students, the trust between teachers and students, the trust of patients and doctors, and et cetera, mm -hmm. and how we see artificial intelligence and mach machine learning. So whenever we consider all of this, we need to consider how we picture good doctors and health professionals in the future, and whether our current medical and health professions education really support that. Are we ready to help our medical students to be medical doctors, which roles, whose roles are probably cannot be determined at the moment? Whether we can really work in the future in, in, in the disruptive environment in the future, and etc. In a way, the human professionals uh, can still bring something for the future in terms of the knowledge and cognition, that metacognition will be very much important. The technical skills where the human professionals, our future medical, our future medical doctors coming from current medical students, they are expected to collaborate well with all the system, including the machines, but then the caring and compassion will still be needed regardless the change of the system, regardless of the dis disruption. Because it is expected that, and this pandemic really uh, strikes us, that 
the literacies uh, is not only about the data literacy and technology literacy, but how then all of these changes influence the interactions between or among human, between professionals, between medical students and medical teachers, and in even in the healthcare. So all of these uh, aspects needs to be incorporated in our curriculum uh, wisely so that we can hopefully nurture the professional development of, of our medical students by still considering the professional identity formation. So this is our uh, study during the pandemic. We try to uh, explore the medical students uh, with the lens of professional identity formation, formation concept by analyzing their written reflections after they complete an online course on uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, in addition to their adaptation processes and coping strategies, uh, including for the learning, we identify that our students uh, have some perceived roles uh, during the pandemic, which is uh, their roles as uh, community health educators and role models, uh, roles in serving the community. And at the same time, we also identify the professional dilemma in fulfilling the perceived roles. So this study provide evidence that during the pandemic, during the disruptions in the learning, during the disruption in the healthcare, uh, our students actually are wondering about what they become, what who they are, what they can uh, do for the society, for the environment, and uh, whether the learning actually support them to, to, be, to be something that they, they and even us as medical teacher, we probably have some struggle in trying to identify what do they need to become in the future. So it means that uh, in our curriculum, probably we need to also provide some opportunities to reflect on and to listen more to our medical students so that hopefully we can support them better. So in addition to the disruption, we do understand the, the role uh, or the existence and uh, very exponentially happening of the social media. And uh, from this uh, systematic review, the challenge that now we are facing is that uses of social media by healthcare professionals and healthcare student, health profession students are tremendous, but there is very limited discussion and discourse on the impact of social media on medical professionalism. How would we navigate that? How the medical curriculum then can support the students to navigate the social media? There are blurring, there is blurring of professional values, behaviors, and identity in the digital era. Whenever we have Facebook account, Instagram account, LinkedIn account, ResearchGate, uh, Twitter, are we presenting ourselves as, as personally, professionally, or both? And how then our realizations and our reflections on that points will give us values and will give us something to hold on whenever we share information, for example. And our wonder at that point will uh, are also the wonders of our medical students. So probably we need to also reflect on our current curriculum, whether we have discussed this dilemma openly. And there is still limited evidence for teaching and assessing professionalism in the digital era. So with that, uh, I would like to start to reflect and probably ask everyone of us to really reflect uh, the implications of this understanding of uh, professional identity formations for us, health educators, medical educators, clinicians, and students. And I would say that uh, this understanding give us hopefully more awareness of the importance of the self and internal processes. Even though we do realize that none happens in isolation, still we need to uh, make sure that our medical students are supported and facilitated in terms of their reflective ability, the adaptability, the resilience, 
and the motivations revisit uh, the true call, the truth calling uh, at certain point of time will be important how then can our students are encouraged to see themselves see where they are at and try to see at uh, try to foresee also what they become so that they can seek feedback and they can be uh, better in, in envision their future and the external aspects and environments this is actually the role of the medical schools the role of the curriculum that we need to be able to see whether our curriculum now is give space for the nurture of this professional identity formations of course we know that our uh, most of the time the medical curriculum is always compact with all knowledge and skills very uh, it's very full already but still uh, whether we can make spaces we can make space to for the students who really reflect on themselves and discuss the dilemma with the mentors and etc uh, and how about our assessment whether we have assessed this uh, development adequately or not and the role modeling the positive role modeling, of course, we expect that from all of our teachers and clinical teachers. However, at the same time, we do realize that it's not always possible to provide positive role modeling at all times. So if we have the negative role modeling, then what should we do? Whether we still provide some space for the students to discuss that openly and so that they, it will, they will also grow in understanding that the environment is not always ideal the mentoring, the workplace-based learning, as well as how we then can invite our students not only in the legitimate peripheral role, but make them more, make them more feel, uh, have the feeling of as the future medical doctors. And one of this is uh, having them more engaged in the, uh, in the patient care, of course, by uh, having or support them by adequate supervision. So that's uh, from me and that's my suggestions on the uh, take on of the understanding of professional identity formation. What's in it for you? Probably each one of us will take different take home message, but I would like to highlight that understanding professional identity formation is very important if we would like to support and nurture the professional development of our medical students. By realizing the importance of the internal process and the importance of the interactions with the social environment and external factors, hopefully we can see our curriculum which, which, with clearer lens. And at the same time, uh, the disruptions, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, hopefully can, we can use it as the catalyst uh, of how we can better nurture the professional identity formations of our medical students. With that, I would like to thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Vindyajini, for that, ni that nice presentation. And we have a lot of questions on that, but uh, we'll postpone the questions to the end. And we'll go to the second presentation, which is done by our own NASET. Uh, Dr. Dilmini uh, Karuna Ratna, and she will be focusing on the second important aspect of uh, transition that is developing clinical reasoning. Uh, Dr. Dilmini Karuna Ratna is a lecturer in medical education from uh, of the Faculty of Medicine, University of Kalania, our own faculty. Currently, she is on postgraduate overseas leave, on, uh, and she works in the same capacity at the Hull and York Medical School, uh, University of York in the United Kingdom. She is a medical graduate from University of Colombo and holds uh, MSc uh, in Biomedical Informatics and MD in Medical Education offered by the uh, University of Colombo. Her MD research was on clinical reasoning and uh, she has explored uh, the longitudinal development of clinical reasoning among junior doctors in Sri Lankan context. Uh, her study was methodologically challenging because she's, uh, she had been observing uh, junior doctors taking decisions, uh, making inferences, etc. And uh, after that, she was interviewing uh, them for uh, their decisions. Her other uh, research areas of interest include clinical reasoning, medical uh, 
curriculum development, faculty development, uh, using technology for education. And she has authored and co-authored several publications for local and international journals, for conferences, and book, uh, she has written a book chapter on clinical reasoning. She has been active in sharing her knowledge on clinical reasoning in both Sri Lanka and uh, in the UK. Uh, her teaching contributions extend, uh, extend to undergraduate and postgraduate education and continuing medical education, uh, both in Sri Lanka and in the UK. She has been an active member of the College of Medical Education in Sri Lanka, and she, ha she has uh, reviewed articles for many uh, medical journals. More than that, I'm sure she's going to be an asset to Sri Lankan medical education in the near future. Over to you, Dilmini. Good morning. I'm Dilmini Karunaratna, a lecturer in medical education at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Kalania. Unfortunately, I'm unable to be there with you today because I have come for my overseas training. I take this opportunity to thank the organizing committee for the invitation, particularly considering the topic which is really interesting to me and an area which I've explored during my MDA research study. Going back to the topic, developing clinical reasoning during the transition from a medical graduate to a junior doctor. This is a very important area to discuss as medical training is all about developing an effective healthcare practitioner and clinical reasoning playing a key role during this period. The aim of today's session is to enable you to consider different approaches that you can employ to facilitate learning clinical reasoning among your trainees. By the end of the session, you'll be able to recognize different views on clinical reasoning and reflect on clinical reasoning challenges encountered by your trainees. And we'll also discuss the theoretical background behind development of clinical reasoning and try to relate it with the clinical performance of learners. At the end, we will have a look at a variety of approaches that you can use to facilitate learning clinical reasoning among your trainees. So what is clinical reasoning? At the outset, you may think that this is quite obvious because it's about all the functions of a doctor and the cornerstone of clinical practice. But if you ask to come up with a definition, you will see that it's not that straightforward. If I ask you this way, what are the key components of clinical reasoning? Then you will see there are a number of factors influencing clinical reasoning, such as knowledge, thinking, decision-making, evidence-based practice, problem solving, critical thinking, knowledge application, communication, teamwork, all these things comes under clinical reasoning. So clinical reasoning as a research discipline has been explored for nearly five decades and people have come up with different definitions for clinical reasoning a number of theoretical models trying to explain it and trying to capture the factors influencing clinical reasoning. I will not take you through all this theoretical information, but for today's session, we will have a look at the current conceptualization or the current views on clinical reasoning. According to the latest conceptualization, Clinical reasoning is considered not only related to the knowledge and experience of the physician, but a large number of contextual factors related to the doctor, patient, and the practice or the clinical encounter influencing clinical reasoning. So if you would like to have a definition for clinical reasoning, it can be considered as a composite of both mental processes and behavior of a doctor exhibited during diagnostic and therapeutic reasoning and influenced by a number of factors related to the doctor, patient, and the clinical environment. So that's about different views on clinical reasoning. How is it developed? 
If you would like to think about your own learning journey, this will require you to think about your undergraduate training, postgraduate training, all the way to becoming an expert or a general practitioner. And during this period, you may have encountered a number of transitions, each of them influencing in different ways towards developing clinical reasoning. So if you have a look at the undergraduate medical training, there is a medical education continuum starting from uh, a student entering the medical school, graduating, and then becoming an expert, and it continues. So our focus today is the period of undergraduate training. So during this period, they encounter two important transitions. These two transitions are very critical periods of learning, having heavy demands on learning clinical reasoning. What are these two transitions that undergraduates encounter during their training? As you may have thought, one important transition that they encounter during undergraduate training is preclinical to clinical transition, where the undergraduates try to apply their theory knowledge to reason with clinical problems that they encounter during practice. The other transition is undergraduate to junior doctor transition. So there are a number of factors influencing these transitions and we will try to have a look at them separately. So what are these challenges they encounter during these transitions? There are a number of challenges. Out of them, one common challenge is the difficulty that they face when translating knowledge to reason with clinical problems that they encounter in practice. So why is this happening? One reason is related to the way that we deliver our undergraduate training. Our teaching is mostly organized around organ systems and we may discuss diseases under these systems. So they, this will encourage them to organize their knowledge accordingly. But when they go to clinical practice, they will encounter clinical presentations, which will require them to think about differential diagnosis, cutting across different systems. So the knowledge that they have, the way they have organized it, does not really facilitate this. And this will require them to mobilize these knowledge structures and create new knowledge structures which are applicable in practice. And this is a tedious process. Many students struggle, even at the level of uh, junior doctors. So as educators, we may have a role to help them bridge this gap. And we will discuss this shortly. So in addition to that, there are a number of challenges specific to different periods of transitions. If we consider the preclinical to clinical transition, as you can see, there are a number of challenges. And these challenges could be seen even in my study. So if I highlight a few, limited feedback they get during training, inadequate guidance are key challenges. In addition, they say that they go to the clinical context, they know the theory, but they don't know how to apply it or reason with clinical problems. And then about assessments, we know that assessments drive learning, but when the assessments are oriented towards knowledge, that does not really encourage students to apply theory or learn to reason with clinical problems. I have taken these two quotations from my study to highlight the challenges undergraduates face during reasoning with clinical problems. So one was saying, the difference is undergraduate time, we were almost like parrots, robot, robots, just read something and just doing what we were asked to do. Another was saying, we have houseman program or the assistant house officer for two days each in the male and the female ward. And those two days were the days that I enjoyed the most in the clinical rotation. You get even a tiny bit of confidence from that because you feel like, okay, when I go as an intern, I'll be able to do something for the patients. So I think this highlights us the struggle 
the students go through and the limited confidence they have reasoning with clinical problems and highlights the role as educators we need to play. So what are the other challenges encountered during the transition from a graduate to a junior doctor? So this is a model that condenses factors influencing this transition. At the center you can see there is migration from a disease-oriented model of reasoning developed as undergraduates to a practice-oriented model of reasoning required by junior doctors. There are factors positively influencing this transition and negatively influencing this transition. We will have a look at them separately. So as you can see, there are a number of factors negatively influencing this transition or the adoption of practice-oriented model of reasoning as junior doctors. Some of the key silences or negative factors are limited knowledge integration, and limited work experience and confidence, lack of motivation, and also some challenges they encounter during practice as junior doctors, like high workload, time demands, poor team dynamics, power gap, limited feedback, and also the internship being more service-oriented than learning. There is less emphasis on learning and the varied individual practices between different specialities and individuals are key challenges for developing this practice-oriented model of clinical reasoning. So in addition, there are a number of factors positively influencing this transition, the adoption of the practice-oriented model of reasoning, and they can be categorized as drivers, facilitators, and sources of learning clinical reasoning. So some of the key drivers of learning clinical reasoning during practice are the availability of role models in practice, the presence of a conducive, safe work environment, and the change of role from an undergraduate to a junior doctor, and the associated professional accountability and responsibility, and the feeling of belongingness to a community of practice are key drivers. Some of the facilitators are the work experience, feedback, ability to reflect on practice, and the reasoning out allowed by seniors so that they make thinking visible, helping them to understand the reasoning process, guiding them in reasoning, and in addition, the individual internal motivation, self-directed learning, and their caring, compassionate attitudes towards patient. So the key sources are the, the individuals that they encounter during practice, like the senior staff and other healthcare staff, patients, and the ward activities, teamwork, and also, importantly, the reasoning errors or lapses, which are key sources of learning clinical reasoning. So in the previous slides, we saw different challenges students encounter learning clinical reasoning, either as undergraduates or junior doctors. So how can we help them to overcome these challenges? So at the curriculum level, there are innovations useful for learning clinical reasoning, such as problem-based learning, small group learning, early clinical exposure, and longitudinal integrated clerkships. Although this is not something we are very familiar with, this is tried out in other countries to give students the opportunity to be exposed to clinical context for a longer period of time, integrating primary care and secondary care. And these innovations gives, gives students the opportunity to understand the relevance of theory in practice and give them the opportunity to apply theory in practice and also helps them in building knowledge structures which are directly applicable in practice. So in addition, to help our students reason better, we will need to understand our learners. So we will need to know who are our learners, what is their level of learning, what do they know, what they can do, and what are the learning outcomes set for their level of training, 
and how they reason with clinical problems. By having an understanding of the theoretical basis of how clinical reasoning develops may help you as an educator to help your trainees reason well. So let us have a look of different stages of clinical reasoning. So there are four stages of clinical reasoning development called the transitory stages in expertise development. You can see the four stages below and we will go through each of them shortly. So it will be easy to explain and understand these different stages of clinical reasoning if we start with the clinical case scenario. So there is an example here. I will read it out for you. So there is a young man who is suspected to be an intravenous drug addict and enters the emergency room. He complains of shaking chills and fever. Fever and chills are accompanied by sweating and feeling of prostration. He complains of shortness of breath. Physical examination reveals a toxic looking man having a rigor. His temperature is 41 degrees, pulse 124 per minute, blood pressure 110 by 40 with clear mucous membrane and examination reveals puncture wounds in his left antecubital fossa. So this case scenario was given to two groups of individuals, novices and clinical experts, and they have given two explanations. So let us go through these explanations. The first one, it says, this man must have been using contaminated needles, which had led to an infection with gram-negative bacteria. This bacteria in the bloodstream led to the activation of antibodies, which explains the fever reaction, high temperature, shaking chills, sweating and feelings of prostration and shortness of breath. So here you can see there is a detailed explanation of signs and symptoms relating it to the basic pathophysiological principles. The second explanation, it says, this drug user has developed a sepsis as a result of contaminated needles. Here you can see uh, this group of individuals, they have used a term called sepsis, which condenses the signs and symptoms elaborated in the first explanation. So I think you can appreciate that the first explanation is given by a group of junior doctors or novices, and the second one from a group of experts. So this is the difference between the knowledge organization of novices and experts. You can see the experts have a highly condensed organized knowledge, the knowledge which is organized under clinically relevant concepts. I will very briefly take you through the different stages of development of clinical reasoning. The first stage is the development of elaborated causal networks of knowledge. Actually, this is how the knowledge is organized in junior trainees. During their early clinical training or early undergraduate training, they receive basic biomedical knowledge, pathophysiological knowledge, and they organize this as knowledge networks trying to explain the causes and consequences of diseases. So when they encounter a clinical problem in practice, they try to activate this uh, networks of knowledge and try to reason with the clinical problem using the basic biomedical and pathophysiological knowledge. And that is what you saw in the first explanation given by junior doctors in for the case study we saw at the beginning. The second stage of clinical reasoning development is knowledge encapsulation. This happens when trainees try to apply their theory knowledge to reason with clinical problems. This helps them to package the lower level detailed biomedical concepts under few high level clinically relevant concepts. This is called clinical knowledge. As you saw earlier, the use of the term sepsis is a result of knowledge encapsulation. This has helped to condense the detailed reasoning using symptoms and signs. The third stage is the formation of illness scripts. 
This happens with the exposure to real-life clinical scenarios and the trainees apply their knowledge repeatedly to reason with clinical problems. This helps them to organize their knowledge in a highly condensed, in a highly structured manner, which is really applicable in clinical practice. So this is how illness scripts are used in practice. At the center, you can see the clinical presentation. So each clinical presentation will have a number of differential diagnoses to consider. And each diagnosis will have an illness script. And within the illness script, there is knowledge about enabling conditions like predisposing factors, demographics, hereditary factors, and knowledge about biomedical causes and about the clinical presentation, consequences, the signs and symptoms. So you will exactly know what to ask in the history and what to look for, the, look for in the examination. So this is the final stage of clinical reasoning development, storage of solved patient problems. What happens here is, now the individual has already developed illness scripts and they keep on applying these illness scripts to reason with clinical problems that they see in practice. And when these patient problems are solved, they get stored in memory. So once they see similar patients, it's a matter of retrieving the past memories and trying to find a match or a pattern recognition between them. So this is the final stage and with and one that is used by clinical experts most of the time. So if we go back to our learning outcomes, we have discussed the current views of clinical reasoning and we reflected on the clinical reasoning challenges and now we completed the stages of clinical reasoning and uh, we try to relate the clinical performance of learners with their stage of clinical reasoning development. So let's see the different approaches that we can use to help our trainees learn clinical reasoning better. I will highlight some key findings from the clinical reasoning literature, which may be helpful to you when you consider strategies to help your trainees reason well with clinical problems. Literature repeatedly highlights the need to actively encourage the integration of biomedical knowledge and clinical science. So this should not be left to students to do it. We should always try to help them integrate this knowledge and deliver it in a way that they can apply it in practice. Encouraging knowledge encapsulation and illness script formation. This is something we need to consider seriously because we know the importance of knowledge encapsulation and illness scripts in clinical practice. And since our trainees are exposed to clinical training early during uh, undergraduate training, this is something we can actually encourage and we need to think of strategies to help them develop these knowledge structures. Another strategy is to introduce to a dual process approach to clinical reasoning. Broadly, there are three approaches to reasoning with clinical problems. That is analytic reasoning, non-analytic reasoning or pattern recognition, and use of both analytic and non-analytic reasoning or the dual process approach. The literature highlights that when you use both strategies together or use a dual process approach, it yields higher diagnostic accuracy. And it encourages that you introduce this to students, not only the analytic component, but also the non-analytic part of clinical reasoning to get the maximum of both worlds. It is recognized that reflective practice is essential towards developing clinical reasoning and feedback is critical towards this. So it is suggested that much time during the clerkships should be used to reflect on clinical problems students encounter during practice. It is also identified by asking students to compare and contrast 
between diseases will help them develop their reasoning better. If clinical case studies are introduced to students as undergraduates to practice clinical reasoning, it is important to consider that you introduce these studies from typical to atypical uh, problems and also uh, en encourage mixed practice where you uh, let them see uh, cases from multiple categories mixed together than uh, blocked practice under a single diagnostic category. This is another important finding, the use of whole cases versus serial queue format. The whole case approach means when case scenarios are used to practice reasoning with clinical problems, the, the case study is given as a single problem, not as uh, triggers or as different steps. This is more preferable for junior trainees because they do not have uh, well-developed illness scripts. The serial queue format, on the other hand, means that a case scenario is given in different steps, in multiple steps as triggers. And this is preferable for senior students because they have developed some form of illness scripts and this will help them to develop them further. These are some other strategies that uh, you can use to help your trainees reason better. There is adequate or enough literature to justify the use of these strategies in practice. One is reasoning out aloud. This means you try to uh, make your reasoning visible to others. You explicitly demonstrate how you analyze the clinical problems, integrate signs and symptoms, and arrive at a diagnosis so the students can try this out on their own. Shadowing is also important. This will help them to apply theory in practice, follow a junior doctor, and get the feel of what is expected of them as junior doctors practicing in the clinical context. This will also help them in developing confidence and also motivating them towards learning clinical reasoning. Having some responsibility and accountability towards patient care is also found to be important in learning clinical reasoning. Having role models, modeling best practices in the clinical context is also important. Making sure that there is a safe learning environment for students to reason, to make errors and learn through errors, to raise any concerns or to reach out for any support is also really important. So we have come to the end of the session. We discussed about different views on clinical reasoning, clinical reasoning challenges encountered by medical trainees, and about different stages of clinical reasoning development. And finally, uh, the strategies we can use to help our trainees develop clinical reasoning. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer at the end of the session. These are the take-home messages from this session. There are two important transitions relevant to undergraduate training. They are preclinical to clinical transition and graduate to junior doctor transition. These are two important periods critical for learning clinical reasoning. Learners should be supported to migrate from a disease-oriented to practice-oriented model of reasoning during early undergraduate training, which is applicable in clinical practice. And this support can address the teaching learning, supervision and monitoring, and assessment needs of trainees. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Thank you very much, Dilmini. Uh, it's a great presentation and we really enjoyed and it was very informative too. So uh, it's open for questions. Uh, the audience can ask questions from the two speakers. They are online. Till they uh, put their questions in the chat box, uh, may I ask a question from uh, Professor Findiatini? Yeah, you're there. So I think um, there's a discussion in the literature about uh, the, the Western medicine as a cultural 
change right it's a culture it's uh, related to a particular culture and uh, it might influence people uh, students and other people who are engaged in uh, western medical practice so have you seen this influencing the professionalism identity formation uh, which we call the scientific thinking in your own research much uh, uh, i think yeah, that's, that's a very pertinent question. question and uh, in regards to the uh, professional identity formations of uh, medical students uh, we we didn't really uh, correlate that with the uh, the the culture because uh, we explored uh, the journey of the professional identity of, of medical students in our in our setting. However, we also conducted a study uh, for the professional identity formations of a medical teacher, and we also addressed the uh, collectivist as well as the hierarchical culture. Uh, one of the things that uh, we find very uh, important is the uh, the role of the role modeling process. So. Uh, it, it has been discussed a lot in uh, in the literature, including in the in uh, the role in the professional development of medical students, not only in uh, Western setting but also in Eastern setting. But I must say that it's very striking uh, the role of the role modeling in a hierarchical culture. So um, uh, even though we didn't really uh, relate that in our uh, study of uh, exploring professional identity formations of uh, medical students, uh, we learned that uh, the uh, the availability of the positive role modeling and the availability of uh, opportunity to discuss the negative uh, role modeling or negative, uh, because we know that in the real practice, we cannot always control everything. So the the opportunity to really discuss that with the mentors in clinical uh, setting uh, for our medical students is very much important because they really, they are they are still really looking up to their seniors so in the uh, hierarchical culture uh, i think uh, it's the role of medical teachers is is, uh, is very prominent i hope it answers the questions uh, madam very much uh, my second question to you is uh, now you are into the measurement of uh, professionalism identity formation in that aspect then we might be thinking about positive way of identity uh, identity formation and a negative way of identity formation uh, what do you think about that is there a correct way of identity formation and an incorrect way of identity formation or how do you interpret the measurement how do you interpret the the findings of the measurement yeah, uh, thank you very much. And that's also uh, that's also part of our reflections actually in our team. And uh, we uh, we try to measure the professional identity formations only to know where, uh, so that we have an instrument to help our to help our students to know where they are at. So hopefully afterwards we can uh, we can help them and we can support them in terms of the professional identity formations. And as we have discussed uh, before. Uh, the the uh, the journey can be very individual, uh, and at the same time, uh, uh, the curriculum can also provide a very strategic support for the students so that they can they will have their individual and dynamic journey, but also in the in the supported and uh, facilitated uh, pathways. So we uh, our aim is to uh, val validate the, the instrument not only to for the sake of measuring the professional identity formations of our medical students, but more into uh, identifying where they are at and further exploring on what they need actually. Thank you, Adi. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have a question to Dilmini. That is about in Sri Lankan context. In our context, we have a lot of students in our groups and then uh, the variation between supervisors is so great and some people have got educational training on uh, supervision but others do uh, others have not got anything like that and uh, the variation between clinical settings are also 
uh, is very high. So how do you deal with all these things in um, helping students to develop clinical reasoning? Dilmini? Yes. So uh, thank you. I think that's a very important question. Um, uh, I think uh, we can look at it in different ways, uh, particularly uh, the uh, staff development will play a key role there to uh, you know, making the trainers uh, aware of uh, how the students, uh, the challenges they encounter in clinical practice and the factors that influence them and how as educators we can encourage uh, to for, for encourage them develop resetting and what kind of a support that we can give. So from that aspect, the, the staff development uh, is very important. And I think uh, as uh, uh, clinical uh, tra trainers, uh, they offered some training at the postgraduate institute level. So to, in, into those curricula, I think we should in, uh, incorporate or add uh, concepts of uh, clinical reasoning and make sure that they are aware of these things so that they can actually practice these, uh, the things that will help the trainees uh, uh, develop uh, reasoning because it is something, the fundamental thing, the, uh, thing that we really want in clinical practice is the, the, like the backbone of uh, clinical practice. So, um, I think understanding uh, is the really important thing rather than that there are small things, small steps we can take in the clinical context. Uh, like uh, as we saw role modeling best practices, the educators knowing that they are being role modeled and, and, and their responsibility uh, towards uh, showing them how to reason, reasoning out aloud so that they show students how to how to do it because many students or even the interns, they, when they start the uh, internship, they say that uh, they, they, uh, they actually they struggle reasoning with clinical problems and uh, seeing how it is done by seniors. It's a real asset to them, so it's 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 much, it is much more important for undergraduates. So uh, things like that, and making sure that there is a safe environment for trainees to make errors, ask for support, and there's in adequate support available for them, uh, and there is good interaction uh, between uh, uh, trainees and the, the supervisors. Uh, they, those things are really important. I think uh, those are the things that we can uh, include in our training and the educators need to think about. Yeah, okay. I think uh, basically what Dilmini uh, mentions is that uh, uh, it's about staff development and reducing the hidden curriculum as much as possible through staff development and empowering uh, students on uh, reasoning abilities. Uh, there's another question I think to Dilmini. Yes, it's to Dilmini. Uh, how best can we incorporate this progression in clinical thinking during simulation? So the role of simulation in developing clinical reasoning. That's the question to you Dilmini. Yes, thank you. I think that is also a very important question, particularly uh, in a situation like this where uh, where there are restrictions uh, to uh, have uh, clinical exposure to some extent. So uh, actually it is seen that uh, the best would be to have uh, exposure to real patients. That is how the students really develop uh, the professional identity, the, uh, the, the, their belongingness to the community and, and, and develop uh, clinical reasoning, get motivation, uh, confidence. That's really important, the real context. But when it comes to uh, when there are situations that we cannot really offer that, or maybe uh, before the trainees go to clinical practice, simulations, technology can play a huge role. Uh, it, it can be of varying fidelity, uh, can be like uh, computer-based case scenarios, or simulate, we have simulators, there are uh, different uh, varieties of video, uh, fid, uh, simulators having different fidelity. So uh, they are really important to uh, talk through the reasoning process, give them feedback, 
so, so to get individual feedback on their practice. So they are really important uh, to develop clinical reasoning uh, during undergraduate training and even postgraduate training to some extent, but you cannot really compensate for uh, exposure to clinical real patients, but uh, simulations do play a huge role there. That's what I think. Thank you very much, Dilmini. Uh, there's another question. Um, while con congratulating for your presentation, uh, the question is, uh, how would you, uh, how do you plan to, to you help clinical teachers in Sri Lankan context uh, to, to apply and to use these uh, findings, uh, the valuable findings that you have uh, described in the presentation? Yes, so uh, that is actually a very important a critical question because it's, it is, uh, what we, that is what we have to do, apply this knowledge to practice that is uh, otherwise it's all in the books. So uh, I think we can actually look at it in two ways. One is uh, uh, trying to promote it uh, in the undergraduate curricula, how we can uh, help our educators uh, help uh, the help students to develop clinical reasoning and at the uh, internship level, so after graduation, uh, how we can do that. So in the undergraduate level, uh, we can think of different strategies. Uh, one would be, as I mentioned earlier, staff development, where we can ensure that the uh, medical teachers get the knowledge, understand the current situation and understand ways to help trainees and also introduce uh, uh, concepts of concepts of clinical reasoning early to students, uh, not not really in a, in a theoretical format, but in a blended way where they actually uh, practice, uh, get the exposure to reasoning, as and then uh, talk talk the theory with that, so that they really uh, see the relevance of. Uh, uh, these theories uh, in practice, because in the literature it says that, um, and even even in my study, uh, I've seen and we also know that uh, the pattern recognition aspect, which is not really discussed, or uh, students uh, learn it implicitly once they graduate, but it is it forms a key uh, key component or key approach to clinical reasoning, so it can be introduced to students as well. So both how to use both strategies, how it can be used effectively, those things can be introduced to undergraduates even. And, um, and opportunities, uh, providing more opportunities to shadow to, uh, as, as, you, as you saw in the, uh, the uh, quotation uh, uh, in the presentation that they really value this experience. So how, to, how we can give uh, more opportunity to uh, work in the workplace under supervision. So those are the things that, that we can think about uh, for undergraduates. And when it comes to internship training, I think uh, it is not really recognized as a period of learning. So uh, we have to, I really believe that we need to uh, structure the internship program where we emphasize both the uh, service oriented and the learning oriented aspect of uh, internship and uh, ensure that the trainers have uh, knowledge uh, on uh, these areas, make them aware of how to help them and, and, and formally uh, ensure that there is uh, uh, adequate uh, opportunities for the interns to reflect on their goals and develop clinical reasoning uh, during the internship. Thank you very much, Dilmini. Uh, as there are no more questions, I would like to thank uh, both presenters uh, Professor R.D. Findiatini and Dr. Dilmini Karnaratna for contributing uh, to the, the, the symposium on the transition from medical graduate to uh, junior doctor as a part of the 30th anniversary scientific session of Faculty of Medicine in the University of Kalania. Thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of the, the organizing committee, uh, I congratulate you and I wish you all the best uh, in your future endeavors and your research work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm really grateful to be part of it. Thank you.